Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Caulfield, class of 01 and 06, master's and PhD in course six, electrical engineering and computer science, and the immediate past president of the MIT Alumni Association. And I also have the distinct honor and indeed the pleasure of celebrating my 20th and also my 15th alumni reunions this weekend. So I'm doubly excited to welcome you all uh, to this one of the first events of this year's tech reunions. Now, even though I can't actually see each one of you individually, I know for a fact that you are each very good looking and erudite. And I know this because you have joined a session that is specifically focused on service. And there are detailed and numerous research studies that show that people who are service oriented and who care about uh, being in service are good looking and erudite. And so we're glad to have you all with us today. One of the exciting things that I've gotten a chance to work on during my time uh, on the Alumni Association board uh, is our strategic plan. And the vision for our plan is to engage and inspire the global MIT community to make a better world. And this is really the foundation of all that we've been doing at the Alumni Association. Um, and this happens a number of different ways in terms of how our alums, our alumni and alumni all around the world do this. It's in their professional work, their day jobs. Uh, they do service for the work that they do volunteering for MIT. Uh, we also do passion projects, things that we just care deeply about and we do them because it makes our communities, our cities and the world a better place. And we have a group of speakers that are gonna share just a few of the stories a few of their experiences, which really capture the MIT ethos that we talk about when we say mind, hand, and heart. And so we are really excited uh, to hear from them. So we're actually gonna have each person to give an introductory presentation, which will be followed by a deep and wonderful and rich panel discussion that we're gonna bring everyone back for. And so our first speaker that I'd like to introduce is Sheila Datya Dasarma, class of 84 PhD in course seven in biology. Shiladitya grew up in the Apollo era when the earth was seen as the blue marble, which floated in the vastness of space. Uh, following his time at MIT, uh, he worked as a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and has since served on the faculty of the University of Massachusetts Amherst and also on the University of Maryland School of Medicine for 35 years. Uh, his lab studies the mechanisms and cell survival, the mechanisms of cell survival after environmental stress and life in extreme environments for example, like those that exist on Mars. But on Earth, uh, he's an environmentalist, a conservationist, and is the founder of the MIT Alumni for Climate Action, a grassroots nonpartisan group committed to science-based actions to combat climate change. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Shiladatya Dasarma. Shiladatya. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it, and also, uh, thank you to the Alumni Association for the invitation to speak to you today uh, at this uh, uh, really great occasion. Uh, and uh, as Eric said, I'm in Maryland. Uh, and uh, in Maryland, we're having uh, quite a wet spring, which I think may also be true over most of the Northeast. Uh, and sometimes it feels uh, more like we're in Seattle here uh, rather than in the Mid-Atlantic. And uh, perhaps you also have noticed that the weather patterns have been changing. Uh, for someone of my age, it's, it's uh, maybe more apparent uh, than uh, a young person like Eric. But uh, I think most of you will agree that uh, you know, the climate is changing. And especially we've noticed over the last 20 years, almost every year has been a little warmer than the year before. And uh, the last five years have been the warmest ever. Uh, and uh, the number of storms have been increasing too. Uh, here in my hometown of Ellicott City, Maryland, there have been 2000 year storms uh, within three years. So, that's uh, pretty unprecedented. And so in uh, about three years ago in 2018, uh, a group of alumni here in Maryland uh, got together and we formed a little group and we said, we really should do something uh, to try and 
bring uh, this problem to the forefront. And uh, so we decided to write a letter, uh, which we sent to all of the candidates that were running for office in 2018, as well as uh, the uh, elected officials who were in office. And we asked them to take bold action on climate. And we were so pleased, uh, this group, it's a very small group at the time, uh, we wrote to our senators and our congressmen, and almost all of them responded with very strong letters of support. And uh, in fact, uh, I think we created a little bit of a stir and uh, we ended up uh, supporting a bill that was in the state legislature at the time. It was called the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and uh, it mandated 50% renewable energy by uh, 2030. And that uh, bill did pass. And so I was really quite amazed by how much uh, support uh, we garnered with, uh, with this letter. So after this, uh, we decided that uh, we would try to grow the group a little bit. And I wanted to share a couple of slides with you. Uh, uh, so we, we got a name, we called ourselves the MIT Alumni for Climate Action, or MACA for short. Some people call it MACA. Uh, and uh, we have a little mission uh, statement here. We support action at all levels to communicate the urgency of the problem and reduce the risk and damage from climate change. And of course, being MIT alums, uh, we support science-based interventions and across the different sectors. And we support the rapid development of renewable energy and uh, solar energy capabilities. And so once we put up the website and we invited people to join, uh, the group grew. And uh, at the moment we have uh, about half of the states, actually 25 states exactly represented in our membership and quite a few uh, countries as well a couple of dozen uh, countries. So it's grown quite, quite a lot. And uh, I think that speaks to the importance of the issue to all of the alumni. Um, so different teams of members have been getting together and uh, discussing and uh, deciding on how to act. And so we have an activities page on our website um, where you can go and you can see some of the different activities that uh, alumni have been engaged in. Uh, there are some uh, who feel that uh, educational resources are the most important and they're, uh, they're working in this area. Others are interested in legislative advocacy. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of people are interested in the technologies such as green hydrogen, uh, national uh, EV standards, uh, and others are climate modelers. Um, and uh, our most recent uh, team uh, is uh, interested in climate justice. And as the group has grown into an international group, uh, there are a lot of international members in the climate justice group. So I just wanted to share with you one uh, activity that we've been working on, which is our roadmap. And this has been sort of across the whole group. Uh, and we've just finished this document and this document is a roadmap for responding to climate change. And uh, this, the document was intended to sort of fill a void between on the one hand, very technical reports like uh, the United Nations IPCC, uh, hundreds of pages long. And then there are some documents that are sort of strident statements by specific advocacy groups uh, you know, our group is a nonpartisan group that's uh, focused mainly on the science behind the climate and uh, changes and also some of the solutions. Hi, so we, uh, yeah. this is Eric. Uh, we're getting uh, notes from the audience asking if you could reshare your slides. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Uh, that looks like victory, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so so here, here is the, uh, the page with the roadmap uh, for responding to climate change. And uh, 
the, the, the roadmap, as I was saying, uh, fills this void between very lengthy technical documents and uh, short um, documents that are uh, devoted to a particular advocacy uh, issue. So uh, it provides, I think, uh, a readable and uh, accessible document for both citizens and for uh, uh, policymakers and really anyone interested in the subject. So in this document, we have the background climate science followed by six recommendations that uh, are made. Uh, okay, so in, the, in terms of the climate science, perhaps the most important is the correlation between carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and uh, changes in global temperature. And as you can see from this plot, there's a very, very tight correlation uh, since World War II uh, the carbon dioxide levels have increased from uh, around 300 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. And there's been a temperature increase of about a degree Celsius. And how important is this? Well, it's a pretty historic change. Um, if you look at uh, the carbon dioxide levels over the last half a million years, it's essentially uh, gone up and down uh, between about 200 parts per million to 300 parts per million. But if you look at the right-hand side with the red arrow, you can see that in the modern era since 1950, it has a very, very sharp spike. And that spike uh, has been uh, studied by the IPCC and uh, they've come out with the predictions of what's going to happen in this century. And depending on how much more carbon dioxide you uh, put into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, we will end up with uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide up to a thousand parts per million. And in which case the temperatures will go up about four degrees. So we also did some analysis of how much uh, a carbon budget uh, we would have. And, uh, and it looks like we don't really have much carbon budget left to limit the increase to under of one and a half degrees. We only have about 300 gigatons and we're putting out about a little more than 50 gigatons per year. So we only have about five to 10 years, probably closer to five years to stop this. So um, the good news is that the cost of renewable energy, which doesn't contribute to carbon dioxide uh, increases has gone way down over the last 10 years, especially uh, the solar and wind uh, industries have done very, very well. And compared to natural gas and coal, as you can see the green bars that uh, they are less expensive. So if you just let the market forces play and, and level the playing field, I think that the uh, changes uh, uh, that we need to make are already uh, going to happen spontaneously. However, based on our studies, these things have to happen very, very quickly. And uh, we have a lot of uh, people with different expertise. So we have this graphic from our roadmap that illustrates all of the different uh, actions that need to be taken. And uh, first and foremost is legislative and uh, we need to incentivize a lot of uh, different things. Uh, but we're also proposing that there should be a climate action authority because the type of problem, the, the, the difficulty, the challenges that we face are, I think, uh, among the, the most uh, challenging that we've faced in a long time. Perhaps after September 11th, uh, we set up a whole department of uh, Homeland Security. And I think that that's the kind of uh, action that uh, this group is proposing to take. So I will stop there and, uh, turn it back over to Eric. I'm sorry about the slides at the beginning, but I think uh, that you can uh, go to the website and, and uh, take a look and I'd be happy to talk to people uh, anytime. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sheila Aditya. I uh, really appreciate it. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Amy Koo, class of 95, course 10 chemical engineering. Uh, Amy is currently the president of the Belmont Redwood Shores School Board. She's also the Vice President North 
for, a, for the Asian Pacific Islander School Board Members Association. And last year was elected to be the California School Board's Association Director at Large for Asian Pacific uh, Islands, API. Amy has a passion for diversity, inclusion, ethnic studies, and the inclusion of Asian Pacific Islander stories in curriculum and ensuring that APIs are well represented in leadership roles, not only in business, but also in politics. In addition to all of this, she works full time uh, as the Director of Managed Markets and Analytics at Gilead Sciences, pharmaceutical company headquartered in Foster City. Uh, at Gilead, she also was uh, also served um, on the Women at Gilead Employee Resource Group leadership team. Turn it over uh, next to Amy Coop. Great, thank you for the introduction, Eric. I really appreciate being here today. And um, really, I I I don't want uh, people to be too concerned about taking notes. I, I put together a document with resources that you could download off of the event site later on. Um, but I'm really glad to be here and want to encourage everyone to consider uh, being active in your community. Because if you've ever been angry about something or um, annoyed by something that's happening, right? you don't want to complain about it, you want to take action. And I feel that MIT alumni can make a huge difference in their local communities because of our unique way of being process and data driven uh, in, in our problem solving. So how did I get involved in, in local politics? Uh, I was an angry mom, right? Anger really helps to drive action. Uh, it was personal. And my son was assigned to a non-neighborhood school. And I didn't have any advance notice that were, there were issues with school capacity. And I'd start talking to a few neighbors and realized that I was not the only one whose child was assigned to a non-neighborhood school. So we decided to storm the school board meeting because that's what you do. You gather signatures on a petition, you make public comment at the board meeting. And after I got there, I realized that there were three other groups already at the board meeting angry about other issues. So taking a step back, I really noticed that there were fundamental issues with the school district. There were communication gaps, a lack of empathy from the existing school board because it was five white men and that's not very diverse. Uh, our student population is half female and one third Asian. Um, so <laughs> there was a lot of lack of empathy as well as uh, underlying operational and organizational deficiencies. So you can imagine that someone from an M MIT background would be very well equipped to tackle these tough problems. So I ran as an outsider and as a change agent. Uh, so I didn't go with the typical getting endorsements. Um, I actually intentionally did not get endorsements and instead focused on a grassroots walking door to door, talking to voters and asking them to vote for me. So the only endorsement I had was from the local paper because that's very objective. Um, it's not based on who you know and, and your network. So seven people ran for three seats in 2013 and I won by 21 votes on election night. It was very close. Uh, it, it goes to show that every vote counts. So if you don't already vote, please vote. Um, and, you know, I, I think with that, I realized that if you work hard, you really can accomplish a lot. Uh, and what did I bring to the school board? Uh, and it wasn't just diversity of, of ethnicity. It was also diversity of experience. Uh, I was the only school board member who had a business and operations background. Uh, there was one that was a stay-at-home mom that was a former lawyer. There was a teacher, uh, a cabinet maker at the time, and then also another lawyer. Uh, so there really wasn't anyone with that operations and business background. Uh, and my proudest achievement was really getting the school district to adopt the strategic plan. Because if you don't know where you're trying to go, how are you going to be able to make the right decisions along the way? So after four years on, on the Belmont Railroad Shore School Board, uh, I felt it was time for me to expand outward because one of the things you want to do as a school board member is also advocate. And in order to advocate, you have to go beyond your own school district and understand what the 
uh, county and state issues and even federal issues might be. So in 2017, I joined the board of the San Mateo County School Boards Association. And I had been really happy with the mentoring and training and networking that I had received through that and, and uh, attended a few legislative action days. And I decided to give back by helping new school board members in a similar way. Uh, and then the following year, I was elected to the California School Boards Association Delegate Assembly. Um, so this Delegate Assembly is a body that has representatives from all across California. And um, they meet twice a year and we provide policy input to the, the board of directors. Um, and we also get a lot of training on legislative activities and uh, CSBA's policy um, stands. And in 2019, I, I uh, was asked to join the API School Board Members Association Board. Um, and the goal of this organization is to really meet the needs of AAPI students within California. And this was actually more of a turnaround opportunity because um, once I had joined uh, as the, a board member for Belmont River Shores, I said, hey, we need to join uh, the APISMA organization because our student population is one third Asian. So we need to, to support them. But I was a little disappointed that there was no membership there was hardly any programming. I said, we got to do better. This, this organization could be so powerful, but uh, if we don't have our own act together, <laughs> then we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, really amplify those messages and make sure school board members across the state know how to support AAPI students. So I joined the board and uh, we aligned on ethnic studies as being an issue that was important for our community because we wanted to make sure that everyone understood the contributions and the struggles of AAPI families and, and people throughout American history um, and, and make sure that we're able to start breaking down those um, racial barriers and build connections. Um, and at the same time, California was in the process of adopting an ethnic studies model curriculum. And uh, between the first and second draft, the first draft had seven sample lessons for the AAPI unit. And by the time the second draft came out, it was down to three. So Pismo was upset to no end. It's like, what just happened? They took out half of the curriculum and even the original seven was probably not enough to represent the diversity of the community. Um, so we, we said we need to do something about it. And being that I'm, I do a lot of project management at work and I said, if you really want to do something in six months before the State Board of Education adopts this curriculum, we need like a project manager, weekly check-ins, I whipped out like a spreadsheet with a project plan <laughs> and people were just going like, holy smokes, are you crazy? And I said, no, I am serious. I'm not crazy. If you want to get stuff done, you need to have a plan and you need to execute the plan. And it's like, okay, stand back, let, let Amy project manage this. <laughs> and it was, it was just hilarious. But I was so excited that it all came together. And um, we were able to get a lot of uh, the issues resolved with the ethnic studies model curriculum. And it was a very um, inclusive AAPI unit that was finally approved by the State Board of Education in March. Um, and in parallel, I, I uh, also at that point was elected to be a, the director at large API for the CSBA organization. And um, thus far this year, you know, with all the AAPI hate and xenophobia, that's been a, a big focus of mine uh, to really provide the perspective as, as a Asian American on what students and families are feeling during this time and making sure that school board members across the state are taking those things into consideration. So my resource document actually has a lot of the links that relate to um, articles and, and uh, policy papers that CSBA has put out from that perspective. 
Uh, so I've really enjoyed the journey and, and seeing my impact uh, be able to grow beyond just Belmont Redwood Shores, but also statewide. And I'd love to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Amy, for not only a, a wonderful presentation, but also thank you for the service that you're providing for the uh, people of California uh, and every urban community. Our next speaker is Guadalupe Hayes Mota, class of 08, course five in chemistry. He also has an MBA and an SM from the Systems Engineering Division, both in 2016 as part of the Leaders for Global uh, Operations Program. Guadalupe is currently serving as the Director of Global Supply Chain and Manufacturing at Ultragenics Pharmaceuticals, where he leads the worldwide production and distribution of the company's gene therapy medicines and supplies to 35 countries. Uh, before that, uh, Guadalupe um, directed uh, global production and distributions of medicines to more than 93 countries and a number of different bio firms, and also ran 12 free health care clinics uh, for underserved populations in the Los Angeles metropolitan area, uh, which gave more than 30,000 patients free health care uh, and medicine. He currently serves on the board of directors of Save One Life, Fenway Health, and is also the, the president and the re-founder of the MIT LGBTQ plus alumni association, more commonly and affectionately known in the MIT community as Paglada. So next we'll hear from Mr. Guadalupe Hayes Moda. Guadalupe. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna present about my work that I've done and I have kind of three sets that I wanna go through. I first wanna explain why I do the work that I do. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Save One Life and the third component, I'm going to talk about the Massachusetts Rare Disease Advisory Council for Governor Baker. So um, to give you a background about where I come from, I'm originally from Mexico, born and raised there. And an interesting thing is like I was born with hemophilia, which is a rare disease. And this rare disease, what happens is that if you hit yourself or you cut yourself, it doesn't stop. Unfortunately, in Mexico, have treatments when I was growing up years old. Uh, I woke up with a, a pain stomach and end up having to have emergency surgery. From the emergency surgery, they didn't have the medicine to really provide me with the medicine. So I bled uncontrollably and that led me to me dying twice. Uh, the doctors didn't have a good prognosis that I was going to die, but luckily I was able to pull through and I was able to survive. And I moved with my family to United States to, to, to get health care. Ever since then, I have made my mission to think about providing health care to those who don't have it, and also to provide medicines to those that really don't have it either. And so that gives you a little why I do the work that I do. I find this very personal. So let me talk a little bit more about Save One Life. So Save One Life is a nonprofit that actually provides free medicines, scholarships, and sponsorships to individuals with rare disease disorders in 30 developing countries. So what we do is we able to provide them medicines. So it's, it kind of takes me back to my childhood where I didn't have access to that medicine. And also it provides scholarships because a lot of the students or hemophiliacs cannot want to be able to go to college and then with that with that they can actually be able to get a job and not do manual work because a lot of the hemophiliacs become disabled most of their lives. This is really important because in in more in developing countries there is no treatment and the treatment because a lack of treatment about 75 percent of those don't make it up out of age 11. So it's a very detrimental almost sentence to death. Um, so it's a very vital program that we provide. I got involved with Save One Life when I actually ended up going to one of the screenings, which was talking about the founder and really where he mount, climbed Mount Everest to really see that hemophiliacs can actually do everything and be able to provide that. And I joined in where I started working with them in their strategic planning to move the, the organization to start opening more countries to be able to provide these. And, but it has been challenging because you come to the, the problems of you can provide medicines to a few individuals, but you cannot provide it to everyone. 
And this is where it gets difficult, where you have to make decisions of like where medicines will go and how would it be distributed. But if those choices are really important to happen. And given my background in within supply chain and operations, it was a perfect fit for that. And it really kind of allowed me to do that. So that's save one life. So it's like an organization that provides that care to patients when they need it. Now, another part that I have been involved is I just got appointed by Governor Baker of Massachusetts to the, the Rare Disease Advisory Council. And so what the Rare Disease Advisory Council does, it, it works with the government, specifically with the governor, the state legislature to provide and think about how we are going to think about rare diseases in the community and within the state of Massachusetts and provide some sustainable solutions. Uh, rare diseases actually impacts about 10% of the population. So it has a huge economic burden within the population. And about 95% of these diseases do not have treatment. And talking about these individuals, they have really difficult lifestyles because obviously they can become disabled or, I mean, in, in, in then really other cases, three out of 10 people with rare diseases do not make it past their fifth birthday. So it's a very important problem to solve. Now, the Rare Disease Advisory Council did not happen overnight. It was, a, it was a pretty much a struggle to get there, really working with a coalition of rare diseases organizations that I'm part of, being part of like the Hemophilia Foundation, as well as empowered to the government in pushing Governor Baker to really enact this and pass this bill for in order to get a council where there's representation for us to take really important decisions for these rare disease patients. So those were difficult times and where really we push forward to get those done. But I think as it just tells you that any voice can be important in what, when you're trying to make change policy-wise. And it's important to kind of think about where those, those pushes can be done. And now when I serve in this board, we're kind of leveraging and utilizing that information to start drafting policy that is really, you know, helpful to change the lives of rare disease patients in the state of Massachusetts. And this is going more on a national level now where other states are doing the same. So where we can actually provide that. So I guess from my talk that I've been talking about, I just have two, three takeaways that I want to get with what I'm trying to say. One is trying to find the why you want to do this and connect to that why. In whatever that is, that gives you a lot of force, which is, which is if it's anger or whether it's like you feel injustice in the world, use that to for advantage and push forward to leverage a lot of the skills that you have in the past, such as like your analytical skills. I utilize a lot of my MBA skills to really push the agenda and a lot of this component. So utilize that. And third, don't give up. I think there's a lot of battles that you have to fight and they're difficult. I think we, I experienced that through say one life and also through the council. But I think if you don't give up, there's always a hope for that change. Thank you for this. So thank you, Guadalupe, um, for not only uh, just a wonderful rendition of the important work that you've done, but a truly inspiring story uh, about what uh, perseverance um, and persistence will do, um, in the, even in the midst of adversity. So thank you uh, for, for sharing uh, your story with us. Uh, we're now going to invite uh, the other members uh, of the speakers uh, to come uh, together uh, where we can have a, a formal a panel discussion. Uh, and I just want to first uh, to, uh, to let the members of the audience know uh, if your, um, your laptop or your tablet or whatever you're viewing this on starts to glow, um, that is, that's, uh, do not be alarmed. That's a normal kind of a, a response that happens when fusion occurs. When you bring tremendously powerful protons together all on the same screen in close spatial proximity, it releases power. And so that's what you're experiencing right now on your screen. Do not be alarmed, it's quite normal. Um, it, it often happens when MIT uh, alumni and alumni or an alums get together and so it's quite normal. Uh, so I first just wanna say uh, to everyone, if you have questions for our panel or things that you'd really wanna know about, uh, we'd ask you to put them in the Q and A field uh, and we'll get to as many of the different questions uh, as we can. 
Uh, again, if you have questions, just put them in the Q&A and we'll be able to tee them up uh, for our panelists. So I just wanna thank you all again uh, for, for again sharing uh, just wonderful insights and the important work that you all have been doing. Uh, because we're at uh, a tech reunions and we're all here together, uh, some of you have, uh, have Cambridge backgrounds uh, on, on your screen. Uh, we'll start there. Um, many of you talked about whether it's organizing kinds of things that you did or analysis kinds of things that you did uh, you know, to be able to push the, the work that you've done. Um, I was curious, and I think some members of the audience would be curious too about, you know, when you're students at MIT, and how much of your experience um, on campus or, or your educational experience going through the Institute helped inform kind of the work that you've been doing? How was it helpful if you wanted to say? Uh, and we'll start and we'll do it in, in alphabetical order, um, just, just because it's, it's, it's easy this way. We'll go with Amy, uh, and then we'll go to Guadalupe, uh, and Sheila, yeah, you can round us out for this question. Sure. Um, I think for me at MIT, one of the um, things that influenced me in terms of my passion around Asian Americans, uh, I minored in East Asian studies. Uh, and, and part of the reason I did that was because when I was in high school, I was really upset that for world history, they skipped over all the chapters on Asia. And I said, if you're gonna do that, why call it world history, right? Then, then it's just Western civilization, you know? Um, so I, I, I did that in, in, um, when I was at MIT. And um, I also did like a summer experience in China after I graduated. So it, I, I really was interested in understanding um, different cultures. Um, and, and I thought the MIT experience was really great too because there were people from all over the place. And um, I remember different uh, student organizations would be selling different foods in, in Lobby 10, but I don't think that's allowed anymore, I heard. <laughs> but back in the day, <laughs> we could do stuff like that. Um, and, and I think in terms of getting out of my comfort zone, I also joined an acapella group. And um, that was a little bit pushing the boundaries because I didn't have formal singing training, but um, I think just going for it and actually getting in <laughs> was pretty amazing. And it gave me the confidence that, you know, I should always give things a try, right? Don't count myself out before I even try. The work could happen is it doesn't work um, and I try again. But um, op MIT was a great place to be able to try different things and have a safe place to pick up the pieces and try again. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, Amy, you just echoed some of the themes that Guadalupe uh, shared in, in, in the closing for his presentation. It seems to be a common. And Guadalupe, did you want um, to, to add, any, add any more about kind of how your MIT experience, uh, you, you alluded to it in your talk, uh, if you wanted to expand on that bit. One of the most important things that MIT gave me was the ability to get a voice and become a leader. Um, and what I mean by that is when I was an undergrad, I came out as gay and I became president of GAMET, which was the undergrad um, gay LBGT plus association. And back then we actually didn't have a pay staff position. So in our sophomore to uh, freshman year, a group of us of Alum, I mean, of students get together to really push the administration to get at someone that's funded, that was able to provide that care. And so we really worked together and it just gave me that advocacy voice to really start thinking and standing up for what we thought was right. I mean, it was a, it was a struggle and it was a battle that we worked together with administration to get this. So at the end of the day, we got it approved and it's still what's right now we have that pay staff position. And so it gave me that, you know, the ability to do that there and really understand and, and move forward. And so I really think that's the best space that I, I learned how to be a leader. And the second thing, it also gave me the ability to, to I, I took a class when actually when I was in, in grad school, it was more grad school in global health. Um, and I ended up working in India and we were looking at the healthcare systems in India into really thinking about how to improve their drug supply, but also the blood supply. 
It really exposed me to a different healthcare system. And it really reminded me that the healthcare system was exactly the same as Mexican system where there was flaws when there was a lot of different places. And so it gave me a perspective of like the broad sense of what does it mean to there's healthcare around the world. And so it exposed me to different places. So yeah, overall two ways, it gave me that leadership ability, but two, it also exposed me to different uh, ways of thinking for the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you've hit on a, a couple of things too about like, you know, just being, not only being organized about it, but advocacy um, and, and, and the important role. Um, I think Sheila, did, you, you mentioned some of those uh, elements of that. Did you, did you want to share a bit about how your MIT experience has uh, in, um, influenced the work that you've done? Surely. Um, so I came to MIT to do, uh, as a graduate student, uh, to work in a laboratory that had established the genetic code and it showed the unity of all life. And one of my first uh, lessons there was that uh, there's a unity of science and there's uh, interdisciplinary work that could lead the way to uh, solving some of the science's biggest problems. And I think a place like MIT is sort of uniquely um, distinguished in that regard. Uh, so the professor that I worked with was a professor of both chemistry and biology. And for most of us who were doing our degrees, we had to select a particular specialty of one of those two fields, chemistry or biology, and not necessarily be professing all of that information. But when you, when you turn and you look at a problem like uh, climate change, you know, there is nothing as uh, broad and over and all encompassing as that. Y you really need to be able to look at the big picture. And I think the uh, kind of education that you, uh, that I received and, and many receive at MIT uh, allows them the uh, sort of the, uh, the knowledge and the skills necessary to be able to analyze the big problems. And that's what makes MIT such a great place, so. I think, I think my education there uh, was absolutely critical for my being able to even uh, consider addressing uh, the kind of problem that this uh, MIT alumni group is doing at this point. Yeah, and actually, and thank you for that. Our next question actually leads back to something a, a bit that you all have alluded to a little bit, and it's actually directed to Amy. Um, you talked a lot about uh, organizing and the work that you did and kind of your motivations uh, behind it uh, in your community. Uh, one of our audience members has asked, um, how would you best recommend starting a community organize if you, if you don't know many people in your community? Say if you first move to a place and you see an opportunity to make some changes, how, how might you think about that? And we have a broader political question for the group, which we'll, we'll ask after you weigh in on that. Sure. Um, no, I think uh, it's a valid question. So when I first moved to the Belmont and Redwood City kind of area, um, I grew up in San Francisco, so I didn't really know that many people in the area. Um, but one thing that was great about Redwood City was that they had something called uh, PACT, which was Partnership Academy in Community Teamwork or something like that. It was a, a city manager sponsored program. And I said, boy, I don't know anyone. I don't know what's going on in the city. So let me try signing up for that. And what they did was they had a group of every cohort that participated in that program would get to meet a different uh, part of the city's organization from park and recs to the police. You know, it, it was just a broad introduction um, to really kind of understand what was going on. Um, and then at that point, they the city had a neighborhood liaison kind of program. So I said, oh, well, I'll sign up to be a neighborhood liaison. And one of the activities was to actually reach out to your neighbors and try and figure out who they were and, and try and organize a, a neighborhood block party. So <laughs> I took advantage of the opportunity to try and start meeting people uh, in the community. There's like a community association. So. Um, I was trying to follow up with all of their activities. So you just have to look around for opportunities to get involved. Because uh, believe me, every, every organization is looking for volunteers. Um, and so if you want to meet people, all you need to do is, is help someone out. 
And then all of a sudden you're part of a network and then they'll refer you to other people. And I mean, that's how that one person in the community association told me, man, you're so passionate about the dysfunction in the school district, you need to run. I mean, if he didn't say that and said, I'm gonna back you up, I might not have run, so. It's amazing how just one interaction can, can change a whole trajectory, in your case of, of an entire community. Um, you all, uh, the next question that came up, uh, you know, uh, from the audience is that all of you mentioned the political process in, in some way or in different ways. Um, there's some folks, and I'll, I'll read it, uh, it says some might be turned off by politics, but it seems critical to all the areas that each of you are working on. Um, and the question that they ask is what prepared you for that aspect uh, of the work? And I think many of you may have alluded to it in your MIT preparation, but if there's other things you wanted to expand either from that time or since that, that helped you be ready to do that, uh, if you could share. Um, and we'll start with uh, Sheila Ditya, and then we'll go to Guadalupe and come back to Amy. Okay, well, that's a, that's a tough one for me because, you know, I'm a scientist and, and I'm not a, uh, you know, political scientist. So uh, perhaps, uh, again, alluding back to the scientific uh, basis for our climate action, I think that uh, having the scientific knowledge is a great place or platform to speak to policymakers. And um, one of the uh, experiences that I had at MIT was that I was part of this very large team. The team had about 35 uh, members, and a, a large number of postdocs and uh, graduate students and uh, several faculty were also involved. So uh, as they say, anytime you have more than two people, you have uh, politics. So uh, it, was <laughs> it was certainly, uh, <laughs> an environment where there was a, a fair amount of politics. And I can remember there were actually quite a few uh, turmoil. Uh, there was quite a bit of turmoil as a result of various actions. So it, it taught me uh, that one needs to be, um, you know, politically astute in, in dealing with people. And um, I think when you come to elected officials, of course, it's a whole different uh, level of uh, political uh, skills that one needs. and. One, one of the uh, great uh, uh, you know, experiences of uh, uh, talking and uh, engaging with other MIT alumni is that they're all such brilliant people and they, they have their own expertise. And so they're bringing in uh, expertise and uh, skills, both on the scientific level as well as the political level that helps us to become a better organization in, uh, you know, uh, pushing for the, the actions that are really going to make a difference in this uh, uh, sort of global uh, fight against uh, climate uh, change. So uh, I would say, again, it's, it, I mean, I think MIT offers the kind of environment that allows people to grow into their full potential. Uh, and that potential is very very, very big, and there aren't the silos, you know, I think that's, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that uh, occurs to me. Thank so, you, Sheila. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Guadalupe, any, any thoughts you wanted to share in that, Amy? Yeah, for sure. Um, so most people get intimidated by the political process because it feels intimidating. And I think when I was walking into it, I thought I was intimidated by it. But I think one of the things to remind ourselves is that politicians and policymakers are always open to talking and it you don't have to be super refined of what you want right you just need to know what you're advocating for and what you're working for and so that something that I that I kind of gain in thinking that you need to you know just advocate for something and it doesn't have to be very polished it just has to have an idea and I do feel like a lot of MIT students or alums have ideas and they have great insights. They might be just scared of how to approach it, but the reality schemes is like the politicians or the policymakers are pretty open and they, it's not like they want something perfect. They just want to hear those ideas. And so I think after I overcame that and kind of after start talking to different uh, policymakers and then engaging in those components, then I was like, okay, then I can actually, what I'm saying is being taken seriously. Mm. And that it's, I think, one of the burdens that it kind of does one. And the second thing that I really, it's pretty much churches, synagogues, 
and um, different components that come together to advocate for Boston politics and make sure that the issues go through. And through that, those experiences, we realized that anyone was advocating. It went from, you know, from people who didn't have any high school. You may be having some nights. The need of it, you know, that everything's connected and that they're just bringing that burden down. It's important. Thank you, Guadalupe. Um, as the uh, elected official on the panel, uh, Amy, is there any anything that you wanted to add about the political process? I'd imagine you might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting because I don't know why politics gets such a bad rap. Um, maybe it's just because a few, like the stories that are told in media sometimes are the the negative ones, right? When something bad happens that gets publicized, but mm. I would say that the majority of the, the politicians that I've encountered are really in it to, to do something about the greater good. Um, and if you don't agree with their decisions, it's maybe because they're not fully informed. Um, so as a school board member, for example, I, I bring a lot of experience and skills to the table, but I don't know everything. Um, and so part of our role is to listen to the community and understand what's going on and try to make decisions that best needs, meet the needs of the community. It shouldn't be about our personal agenda, but that's why I think it's so important for people to uh, advocate, right? Because if you don't speak up and the, the politician doesn't know, then they're going to make uh, a less optimal decision because they don't have all the information. And I think the other thing too is, is, is if there's a politician that's not representing you well, you need to vote them out. Um, so I know a lot of people will complain about what's happening, but then they don't go to vote or they might vote, but they don't do the research on the candidates or the, the bills that are on the table, right? And if you do that, then um, not so great people might get elected because they just happen to have the loudest voice or have big money behind them. But um, if you actually do the research and be educated, then the, the politicians will do the right thing to, to support the community. Um, but that, that's why I care so much about education as well, because I really feel that the foundation of a strong democracy depends on the voters being educated and, and knowing what's going on. So thank you all uh, for that insight. There's one other question which is uh, which has come up, and I think it, it actually uh, gets at the heart of a lot of what we've talked about. We've got some issues which are existential, which impacts long-term everybody. We have others that are very deeply personal and immediate and urgent. Um, the question that we have from the audience is, how do we navigate between the immediate needs and longer-term solutions? Uh, for example, you know, how can we work on systematic hunger issues but in cases where people need food in real time, how do we think about balancing those immediate needs with kind of the longer term? Uh, and so we'll, we'll uh, start out with, uh, with Guadalupe and then we'll come back to, to Amy and, and uh, Sheila Ditya yeah, will close this out. Again, that, that's a great question because sometimes you're trying to battle when you're doing things of, you know, it's always, there's always so many resources you have. So there's always scarcity, right? So you have to realize how you're going to, allocate those resources and how you're going to put that time into it. And so the way that you think about it is it becomes almost like an ethical question of like, what exactly seems to be the right solution? And I guess coming from a healthcare perspective, um, have worked in healthcare and managed healthcare systems and been in boards of a different healthcare institutions. That's what we face. We, we don't, we want to change healthcare, but it's very difficult to do. Um, and because there is not enough resources. And so it comes down to thinking about how do you allocate those resources? And when you go and start thinking the allocation of the resources of what kind of impact do you want to have as an organization? Because you cannot fix every problem. And that's the thing that you have to think about, like what exactly is our immediate and the most pressing issues and use, utilize that to kind of give you that pathway of getting to a solution. Uh, an example for this is like for the, the rare disease stuff, the reason that was created is because financially it's a big 
so we can our overall healthcare system broadly. And so I think it's mostly just prioritizations and seeing where you, you actually have the greatest impact. Thank you, Guadalupe. Um, uh, we'll turn now uh, next to Shiladitya and then Amy will close this out uh, on, the, on their last uh, responses on this question. Hugh? Okay, sure. Um, so this is a very important question that you raise, Eric, and it's, um, it's worthy of a, a, a lengthy conversation, I think, because it, as you say, it impacts across the board. Uh, you know, the, the, the issue of uh, in climate action is one of uh, mitigation versus adaptation. You know, uh, do we adapt to the changes that we can foresee coming in the next few years or a decade first and then uh, address the longer term problems or do we do it the other way around? And uh, in that question is actually buried a lot of uh, I guess, uh, different perspectives on the problem. Then there's also the issue of, of justice, climate justice, because a lot of the problems that we are facing now is as a result of certain demographics, certain segments, taking certain actions. So I, I do think that it's a wonderful uh, issue that you've brought up and it, it's one that is extremely complicated. Uh, but I think the, Climate problem uh, raises the need to do everything that we can right now. So uh, we need to do both. And it just, in my mind, uh, you know, underscores the importance of really trying to do it all at this time. So we need to do both. Thank you, Sheila Ditya. Um, Amy, did you have any, any brief closing remarks? Yeah, um, I think from a, a school board perspective, this past year has been a, a very big example of <laughs> everything is about the near-term priorities and not our long-term priorities. Uh, but I'll, I'll give an example though. Um, we had already started you know, two, two years ago working towards um, an equity action plan um, and really educating ourselves on that because we looked at our own data and we saw certain student groups not doing as well. Uh, but all of that work kind of got put on hold when the pandemic hit and everything was going crazy. We had to pivot to virtual learning and every week was a firefight. All board meetings were ending at midnight. So <laughs> it was a little bit insane. Uh, but finally, as things are winding down, we're actually picking the equity work back up, um, returning to it. And in some sense, there is a lot more engagement in the equity work now because the pandemic has really showed everyone how many of the inequities exist in our, our school systems. And so there's a lot more uh, focus on that saying, hey, let's take advantage of this. We know that not all kids did well during distance learning and there's a lot of mental health issues. So how can we really meet every child where they are and help them succeed and optimize their, their opportunities? Um, so it's kind of interesting. At, at least we knew this is what we wanted to do. We had to take a brief detour uh, and now we're coming right back at it. And it was always in the back of our minds. So I think that's where um, don't, don't lose track of the long-term, even though you get those short-term detours because the opportunity to um, re-engage is, is there. So thank you, Amy. And, and with that, I think that is the perfect note uh, for us to, to close today's panel. Uh, so I just wanna thank all of you, Shiladitya, uh, Guadalupe, uh, and Amy so much, not only for participating in today's panel, but for really embodying um, the best of who we are um, as, as MIT in terms of the service that you're doing to your community. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, also, I uh, wanna take a moment to thank the members of our staff, uh, Jessica, Lizzie, and Jamie, uh, who have made it possible for us to all be here today. Uh, the Alumni Association uh, is gonna be continuing to work on the launch of our uh, Alumni uh, Service Initiative, uh, which is really gonna celebrate uh, uh, what we, can do as a community and to really be a force multiplier for the things that we're doing in the world. It's gonna be equal parts uh, networking site, a place where folks can connect across different causes, uh, where we can share our stories about the work that we're doing. 
uh, whether it's on STEM education, social justice, equity, whether it's sustainability, climate, health, many different um, things where we can all uh, connect. Uh, we're in the process of developing our uh, digital presence, but what we really are looking for right now is folks to get in on the ground floor and really to spread the good word about the good things uh, that are gonna be happening uh, as a part uh, of the initiative. We're gonna be dropping some information in the chat for folks who wanna find out more or, or, to, or to get involved. Uh, and so you can look there to find it. And so once again, I just wanna thank all of you um, for uh, attending today's program. Uh, and for all of the things that you're doing uh, in your community uh, as well, and invite you to get involved and to support the initiative when it launches uh, more formally later on. And so with that, uh, thank you again. It is good, even though I can't see you, to feel your presence as part of Tech Reunions this weekend. And I wish you a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Tech Reunions and weekend. Thank you for joining. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.